we're going to go through uh, the agenda real quick. We'll talk about a little bit about the uh, applied software and uh, GeoShack partnership. We'll be talking a little bit about uh, changing the way you work uh, when it comes to BIM and what BIM is uh, doing with the industry. Mark will go over the tools in the office, uh, some of the softwares, um, coordination and things to do to make it easier for GCs and MEP contractors to work together. We'll go over the control points in the field and some of the field coordination and then talk about stakeout versus layout and also how to get that information back to the office so that uh, we have a full circle of taking points out of the field and bringing them back. And then we'll entertain any questions that anybody has. First off, uh, GeoShack is uh, TopCon's largest dealer in the world. Uh, we provide production and our pr production and measurement solutions to several different uh, trades, several different uh, markets in the construction, survey, agricultural, landfill, mining. Um, a lot of our products include machine control, GPS, total stations, lasers, laser scanners, UAVs or drones, and software. Applied Software, headquartered in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, has locations across the U.S. and Canada as well. They have an expanded network of resources to provide talent available to clients for in-person, via, or web sharing technology. Um, you can see all their locations there on the screen. And our relationship between Applied Software and GeoShack really goes to the fact that so when the uh, um, Topcon and Autodesk partnered uh, with their BIM solution. As the two largest providers for each of the manufacturers, we were trying to get, uh, GeoShack was trying to get into the software business at the same time Applied was trying to get into the hardware business. And we realized that uh, we weren't experts at each other's business, so we decided that a partnership between these two companies would work better. This is a in writing, signed, documented partnership. And with that, we also have several other partners that we uh, partner with throughout the United States. Here are GeoShack's locations. I uh, apologize, our map's just a little off. Most of our, uh, our, our locations are in Texas. You can see them in the red states, Ohio, and then up into Canada here. And um, with applied software, our map's just a little off, so I apologize. Um, having these and our partners, it really allows us to cover the entire uh, North American market. So to kick off, that's a little bit about us, but to kick off, one of the things that I hear and see online all the time is BIM is not Revit. And that's true. Mark and I are going to talk today about several tools, but you know, BIM's not CAD, it's not total stations. Um, these are all tools that we use in BIM. And what we're really trying to do is coordinate all the different processes that GCs and subcontractors have and really meet in the middle here and talk about collaboration, about sharing information and sharing um, the model, sharing the field work out, out in the field and how we how we make that easier for both parties or both you know the subcontractor, the contractor, and the uh, even the, the architects so that it makes it easier for the owner. So when I hear BIM versus building all the time, one of the things we hear are you know GCs or they want BIM so they can coordinate themselves and their sub trades to speed up their internal process, and they want to visualize, simulate, and analyze this model. They want to see it, they want to do it, and they want to make sure all the errors are out of it at the, at the uh, um, pre-construction phase. Subcontractors want that too, but they're more interested in how they're going to fabricate their stuff so that they can do it beforehand. And a lot of times when I, when I talk to subs, they, they, they want 2D and they, they sometimes think that BIM slows down their field process, not their prefabrication or their modeling process, 
but their field process because of changes and inaccuracy. And I hear this all the time when we're on demos and we're showing people our our solutions are, well, we've worked this way for 20 or 30 or 40 years and it's always worked for us. But as these models and as this technology improves and as these processes um, streamline the workflow between the general contractor and the subcontractor, you really have to change some of the things that you're doing, uh, whether it be in the office or the field, and sometimes those pain, those changes are a little painful. BIM is a process, and what I want everybody to realize in today's webinar or any time we're doing a presentation is that we present you a, a, a plethora of tools to do this, these are not something that you have to do everything. You have a choice of when you want to do them and how you want to implement them that is best for your business. But eventually what the goal is is try to get to this new process so it does a couple things. First of all, your process should coordinate your model so that the GC and the subcontractors are working with the same model and that model should be updated and checked often. A lot of times we see that the model's made and then, you know, things are sent to the field, 2D plans are sent to the field, 3D plans are sent to the field. Somebody gets them and, hey, that's that's it. That's I've got my plans. If you've been in this business and you've been in the process of BIM a little bit of, or even a lot, you'll notice that those plans change quite a bit. Um, and you're going to see some things that, that we have that, you know, is better than an email because I've been uh, projects where somebody's laying out from plans that are two weeks old or even two months old. And that is the process of BIM is to try to get information to you more quickly. That information with the job site should be coordinated. And when we're speaking of that, we typically speak about control points um, for the field should be the same X, Y, and Zs for everybody, architect, GC, S, and the subcontractors, and even the survey, so that everybody's coming off the same point of origin. And that's important because we've coordinated this models. If the model that I'm using isn't the same as everybody else's, it's really slowing my building process down. This speeds up pre-construction, and it also increases the actual construction process, the speed, by reducing mistakes and being able to quality check and quality, and quality assurance and quality control so that errors can be fixed early in the process. We all know that errors are always there. Our error and mistakes and errors are going to be made. We want to try to reduce these mistakes early so that they don't come and cost us a lot of time and money. This reduces our cost of production and tries to keep you on or ahead of schedule. So what I'm going to do now is I'm actually going to go over to Mark and make him the presenter and what he's going to do is show you some of the tools that we have in the office so that we can uh, quickly, um, doesn't matter what uh, software, um, AutoCAD software we're using or Autodesk products that we're using, how uh, we can get this information out to our field guys, and then uh, he's going to throw it back over to me in just a few minutes. So I'm going to make Mark the presenter here. You should be able to see his screen in just a second. Great. All right, Ted, can you see my model? I can. All right, great. I'm getting a thumbs up here on my side. All right, guys, so what I want to talk to you is Autodesk Point Layout. And a lot of people, you know, hear, hear about Autodesk Point Layout and the ability to put points in, in models. Um, before I do that, I want to talk to you about the coordinate system and getting our models linked together. Um, it's not uncommon where we have models and drawings created by civil engineers, uh, structural, MEP, and uh, architects. So I want to talk to you about how we can link coordinate systems, whether we have models that are done inside of Revit or inside of AutoCAD or even inside of Navisworks. 
So first thing that we tell people is and when, whenever we have people that want to start using Autodesk Point Layout robotic total stations is you need control. You need control points at the job site. What are controls? Controls are anything that exists at the job site and also exists inside of your model. Now I'm saying model. We can also work with 2D floor plans or 2D uh, uh, MEP plans as well. It does not have to be 3D, but we get some uh, added benefit working in a 3D world. So when we talk about control, we normally instruct our users to get control points. In this example, sometimes control points might be an Excel file, it might be a CSV file, it might be a text file. It may even be just a simple PDF that, actual had, that, that actually shows um, coordinates of specific points. Now in this case, this example I have a control file that shows maybe coordinates XYZ for my grids, uh, maybe for any PK nails, PK sets, some stakes, maybe edge of concrete. Um, you never know what you're going to get. But the most important thing is that if you do get coordinates at a job site, those objects at the job site must exist here in the CAD file or the Revit file. So in this case, I was provided coordinates for grid A1 and grid A7. And here's my XY coordinates. Uh, for my surveyors out there or people involved with surveying, it might be northing, easting, and elevation. So in this case, I have XYZ. So I'm going to slide this off the screen for a second. And I'm going to switch over to a structural view or a, a plan view, excuse me. This could be, in this case, it's a structural view, but it's, it is a plan view where I have grid. So in this case, here's my grid intersection. Um, column grid 1, column grid 7, and column grid A. Um, most of the time when we get controls from the surveyor, they'll provide it to us in some large number, and we refer to that as state plane coordinates. Or we can just work with a generic coordinate system. It really doesn't matter what these numbers are. What's important is that we're all using the same coordinate system. So inside of Revit, the way I would do this is I would say, all right, I'm going to work with grid A1, which happens to be this intersection right here. So with Autodesk Point Layout, I'll come over to Coordinate System. I'm going to work in decimal feet, and I'm going to work on a particular level. And I'll select this intersection right here. Now I just want to make sure that is my grid A1. I'll select that intersection, and it's going to ask me to type in the coordinate system. Jumping back over to my Excel file, I'm simply going to take these coordinates and I'm going to copy it and I'm going to paste it right here inside of Revit. Now I do want to separate these by commas, so I'll accept that and I'll click OK. And then I'll run over to grid A7, which is this intersection, and I'll do the exact same thing and slide this over, sorry. And there's grid A7, and I'll copy that coordinate. And again, I'll just separate this by a comma. Now, if everything works out correctly, when I click OK, okay, it should it should prompt me and tell me it should ask me for a name. If I get a message like this that pops up that says, "Hey, your drawing points versus the new points, they have a difference of length by 0.25 feet," and I always tell people when this pops up this is a problem. We want to avoid this because this is letting us know that there's uh, one or two things are happening. Either, either these points that were provided to us are wrong or in the model, and I'm going to hit no here because I don't want to continue, or within the model the grid the, the grid intersections that were provided to me are wrong. Now I could have made a user error and picked the wrong control points or the excuse me the wrong grid intersections or sometimes grid inter the grid lines do move and this actually happened on a particular project where the grid lines actually uh, grid grid line number one actually did move the structural engineer moved the grid line but did not notify the architect or the MEP or, or the MEP uh, engineer um, looking back here inside of CAD 
the same exact workflow. Now I did highlight in yellow grid intersections uh, 1, 7, and A just to make it a little bit easier to see. But you'll also know this is typical where the MEP engineer may not be working in the same uh, coordinate system as everybody else because they started modeling and maybe north was set up in a different direction because they weren't concerned about north. They were just simply concerned about the building footprint that was provided to them by the architect. And so now they're working where their true north is different from everybody else. Well, again, with APL, I would run into the same situation or I do the same workflow where I would set up a new UCS. I'm going to work in decimal feet. And again, I'll pick this intersection right here. And I'm going to go ahead and copy and paste. And let me bring up that file again. And I'm going to select, it's a little tough here, but I'm going to go ahead and select grid A1. And I'm going to pick this coordinate system. And I'm going to paste it right here. And I'm going to separate that by a comma instead of a tab. And I'll do the same thing right up here. This is grid A7. Again, my, my coordinates are rotated, but using the APL, I'm going to copy, copy my coordinates for A7. I'm going to copy those coordinates, and I'm going to paste them right in here and separate them by a comma. And I'll click OK. Oops, and that happened real quick. And I'm going to, what and I'm going to back right up, guys. I'm sorry. I hit the enter key a little bit too quick. So I'm going to do that one more time real fast here. A7. I'm going to copy this and do this one more time. New C UCS. Pick this intersection. Paste it. Comma. Comma. And I only have to do this one time. I'm going to pick this intersection. And I'm going to pick grid intersection A1. And this is what it should do. It should ask me to name this new coordinate system. Now, because these points were provided me to by, let's say, a surveyor, maybe these are related to Georgia State Plain, I'll name this and call it Georgia State Plain. And I said plan, but I can rename that. And if you notice, it says Georgia State Plain, and if I switch over to my top view, this now puts me in the same coordinate system as my Revit model. And so now I can make sure that both CAD, Revit, and Navisworks could all be in the same coordinate system. So when I provide my field team a list of points, they will all line up relative to each other. Now, Thad, did you want to take this over, or do you want me to go ahead and put some points in on a few hangers here? Go ahead and put some points in, Mark. Okay. So for those of you that are using CAD MEP, all right, I do have the ability that I can manually place points on hangers, and that's, that's not difficult to do. But with the most recent version of APL 2017, I do have CAD MEP ability here. This model came from CAD MEP. I'm going to select this, and I'm going to place points on my pipe hangers. And I'll just give this a brief description here, and I'll just put in here pipe hanger points, or just pipe hangers. I'll select OK, and I'll place this on all my hangers. I'll click All, and I'll place, and I'll select Hanger. And I'll wait a second there for that to finish. And now if I zoom in, you notice that all my hangers now have a point on them. And that quickly, it picked up the CAD MEP hangers. And if I bring up my Manage dialog window, these are all the points that it has placed hangers. It also recognized the size of my pipes. So it also added in the description, whether it's a 1-inch pipe or 2-inch pipe, all the way up to 8-inch pipe. And it's also recording the elevation as well. So that quickly, I'm able to place points in my model. Now, one last thing I'll show you here is I'm going to switch back over to my top view. And I'm going to let me just rotate my view a little bit. Um, these are all my grid intersections. And these are the coordinates for all my grid intersections. 
So what I'm going to show you is how I can bring those in as control points. Because right now I've only set up a coordinate system, but I need to bring in some grid. In, uh, I need to bring in those points into my model so I can relate this to the job site. So I'll come over to control points. I'm sorry, not there. I'm going to import. I'm going to import my control points. I'm going to select my file. These are all my coordinates, but I just set up a coordinate system, and I want to make sure I change this to say use the Georgia State Plane coordinate system. If I don't do this, those points could show up anywhere on the screen, but because I set up a coordinate system, I told it and I gave it a name, I'm going to select my Georgia State Plane coordinate system, and I'll place it on a layer called APL control points. I'll accept the size and the height, and I'll go ahead and click OK. And it's going to ask me one more time, what are these points? These are going to be control points. And now if I zoom in, just waiting for my screen to catch up here, and I'll just rotate this so that these are readable. But it's gone ahead and it's placed in those control points at every grid intersection. So when I head to the job site, if I need to set up my robotic total station, uh, by the way, if these are offsets, I can offset them, but these are exactly where they needed to come in based on what the file was provided to me. And now I can see quite quickly how um, these points, these control points were placed at every grid intersection. And if I check my points here, Right here, it's telling me this is grid L7-H, and here's my point number, and that is a control point in the CAD file. So everything I just did here in CAD, if I take that same text file and I bring it into Revit, it's going to line up in the exact same location. So now I know that my CAD file, my Revit model, and if I proceed over to Navisworks, my Navisworks model, my points, when I place them in there, they're all going to align properly and in the exact same location as they do in the field. And with the exact, exact same X, Y, and Z numbers. The exact same numbers, yep. Because I set up the coordinates um, using these, these, these coordinates right here, inside of CAD, Revit, Navis, they will all align in the exact same location. Yep. All right, Ted, you want to take it over? Sure. And I'm uh, waiting on you, Thad. Oh. Share your screen. I'm I'm trying. Let me let me do it here. Yep. Um, oh, actually, I tell you what. Let me go ahead and do that. I'll right. keep, I'll make you presenter. <laughs> All right. Okay. You can see my screen then, Mark. Yes. Okay. So. When we talk about robotic total stations and going out to the field, one of the reasons that these help us with the BIM process is that not only are we able to lay out in the field faster, but we're able to take information from the field and get it back to the office. And this is very important to our process. So before using tape measures and books and printed hand CAD drawings, we could get information out to the field and we, couldn't, we could get it, but it was very difficult to get it back to update the 2D plans, to update the blueprints, to update any of our notebooks. You know, we didn't want to give that information away because it had so much information that was valuable to us as we're actually building things in the field, especially for the subcontractors. So, you know, you see this all the time and, you know, this is, this is one of my favorite where they're putting the keys down on the tape measure to try to get it. but. Total stations in the field help us do two things. They help us lay out faster, and they help us lay out more accurate. The third thing that that's actually, I should have said three things, but the third thing that is on there is that we know our mistakes before we start working with a robotic total station. If we go out and these control points are in the field and we go to check them and something's wrong, we know to stop then. We don't waste a half a day or a day or two or three days laying out points in the wrong place. So one of the things about control and what Mark was saying is that 
if you're a GC and you're working with, with uh, subcontractors that aren't using robotic total stations, one of the things to uh, encourage them or is that they, this keeps everybody honest and vice versa. If your subcontractor working with a GC that says we're not responsible for control, we'll talk about that in just a minute, but control keeps everybody honest. If we're all measuring from the same coordinates in the same places in the field, then we will, will reduce errors between the trades. How many times have you been out in the field as a subcontractor or a GC and someone says you're laying out in the wrong spot, I'm the wall guy, I'm using a robotic total station, I'm in the right spot. If they came off a of project control, I would tend to agree with them most of the time. Their mistakes can always happen. But what we see a lot of times is when control is not provided, people are measuring off of built objects, columns, um, putting in their own grids, putting in their own control points. And even if they're off by a little bit, it can make a huge difference in the building process. So we encourage our general contracting customers to get the controls and share them freely with your subcontractors and for the subcontractors to request this control. I don't care how great the model is, if the points out in the field aren't matching the model, I don't care how good your model is, this is where typically where the BIM process starts falling apart. So one thing I want to say, um, we have several general contractors out there that not only take responsibility for their control, but are liable for their control. What I want to make sure is that if you don't want to be liable for your control, don't think of the responsibility of providing control and being liable as the same. So our, we have several GCs out in the field where they're actually providing control points. They're taking the surveyor's control points and they're putting them in the building, whether it's on every column grid, whether it's a few points on each deck or each uh, um, floor, they're actually going out and putting those in and taking responsibility for them and being liable for them. They're, they're putting them in. Some of our GCs hire in this control work. They don't want to be liable, so they're hiring a surveyor and engineering company to take that liability off of them. It should still be their responsibility to get those points into the models and to get them to their subcontractors and get it coordinated like Mark showed so that everybody is on the same page. We have several contractors that we also work with and I, and I get this a lot and they say we're not being responsible. That's, that's the subcontractors and that is, it, it's a philosophy that some contractors take the reason I don't like that philosophy is you can, again, be responsible for the control without being liable for it because if I get everybody working on the same coordinate system and everybody coming off, even if there's a little bit of air and we're all airing in the same direction, the building process goes smoother. It's faster and there are less errors, which is what the whole BIM process is trying to do, trying to make you faster and less errors. And if we do find an error, we find it early. So that being said about control, when Mark goes out, typically these control points are marked. They could be chiseled in the concrete. They could be, you know, rebar or hubs around the project. They could be put, placed at grid lines, wherever. But we're going to set up our robotic total station and we're going to check these. The reason that we check these is that first of all it gives us rotation and second of all, like I said, if something's wrong with that control, whether it be in the office or in the field, we know before we go lay out. So what I want to talk to you about next is the layout versus the stakeout. So we handle with people all the time, hey, we need to go lay out these points. Layout allows you to take the points from the model and mark them in the field so you can install from them or even QAQC those points. There's a difference between just laying those out and staking them out. Layout, yes. This is where most people stop with the BIM process. They go lay it out in the field and mark it and go on to their next point. What stakeout is and what we mean by that with our terminology is stakeout, we're actually allowing you to do the same thing. You take those points out in the field from a model, mark them in the field so that you can install or QAQC, 
and then save the as-built point. Even if it's not perfect, even if it's just, uh, you know, a quarter inch off or an eighth of inch off, even if it's a foot off, hey, this is where this is supposed to be. But the stakeout allows us to also, hey, I'm supposed to be right here, and there's supposed to be a hanger here, yet I know I'm sitting over structural steel. Now they can move that stakeout point, record it, and when they send the stakeout points back to the office, that can all be um, fixed very quickly, and Mark will show you that when I, when I shoot this back over to him. But you want to be able to send this information back to your office team, back to the general contractor or the BIM manager, whoever you're sending these points to, and it's different with every general contractor and every, every project, I understand that, but typically there's somebody that needs the, that point information. A lot of times it's yourself, because if you run into a problem in the field, aka a um, mechanical contractor going to put a, um, a hanger in and there's structural steel there, they're going to have to move it, and that move is going to affect not only them, but anybody building around them. So the whole idea is to be able to compare these to our, our actual, to our model, and put it back in the, in the BIM model so that we can find mistakes before a deck is poured or before it really costs us a lot of money or as I have there before it's too late. So how do we bring these in? Mark sends us that text file. We bring it right into our, our software and I, I can, um, you know, if anybody wants a demonstration of this, we do demos of this. But we're using the Autodesk point layout. We're taking the hardware robotic total stations. In a few days of training, we can teach your teams how to do this. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to pop out of here real quick, and I'm going to start my software. So here is a typical software, and one of the softwares we use, this is Topcon's Magnet Field. Mark, can you see that okay? Yes, we can see it. Okay, great. And if I go to the plan view here, I'm going to zoom in a little bit, and you're going to see my total station here in the middle, and I've got it on a control point. And we were out here staking some of these points along a, uh, along a, um, a pipeline inside a building. You can see the HVAC and everything else in there. So when I go to stake out that point, there's a button that allows me to save it. And when I save it, it actually tells me in the field what my differences are between the actual and the model that I've loaded in my data collector here. And if I look at that, my points, it shows me I have point three here. And you'll notice there's some differences between the design and what I actually laid out. But we're pretty much within our tolerances on these. The elevation may be a little off. We may care about that. We may not. But on this one, we had a little bit of a difference. So if we were worried about X and Y, there they are. And when I, at the end of the day or any time during the day, most of this equipment that we have today, I don't have to wait for the end of the day. I don't have to wait for the guy to tear down out of the job site, come down off the building, go back to the job trailer, get on a computer and email it. Most of these that we're using now are tablets or iPads where we can quickly take a point and send it out. So all I would have to do in this is hit my exchange button and say I want to send my file to a file and I've got a text. All I need is a simple text document or ASCII file. I'm going to hit next and it's going to tell me I have 15 points total in codes. But it also allows me to choose, and all I don't want to choose all the points. I want to give back, back mark all my design points. What I want to be able to do is go by type. And I can choose from all these different types, and I'm going to go to stake points. So when I choose stake points, these are the ones I've actually saved in the field. These are my as-built points. We hit next. We name it. Mark one, comma delimited in X, Y, and Z. We hit next. And those three points that I staked are now exported. I can send those via email, via um, um, 
cloud-based, or we have several different ways to do it, but that can be done several times during the day. So it's not like we have to wait anymore. So just a couple button pushes like that, we can get information back to the office. And now I'm going to have Mark go back and show you, to make Mark presenter again, show you that we did some moves and do a quick move in there. Great, thanks, Dad. All right, so what we're going to do is I'm going to go to a file. Um, boom, boom, boom. Let's go to with points. So in this example, um, we've placed points in the model. We we have you know hundreds of points in the model. Um, I provided the point file to that he's headed out to the field and he's located those points and then he's he's actually uh, the term is we he staked out the points and those points are now referred to as um, I'm sorry he has staked out so the points initially will say stake out and then when he gives them back to me they they're now labeled as being staked so one of the options I could do with Autodesk point layout I could do a compare function now the guys in the field they know immediately if the point that they've laid out if they're within tolerance and that tolerance could be whatever you decide it, it, it can be it could be a sixteenth of an inch it could be a quarter of an inch it could be more um, but the guys are know, know immediately but um, at, at, for our BIM guys in the office they may want to do a quick compare just to see how well or generate a report to see how well the guys have been working in the field now when I come up here I could select a file to compare um, I come over here and I could select my duct hanger point. Now, this is a text file that was provided to me by by uh, Thad. I think initially he called it Mark or Mark One. Um, in this case here, I I called it on my system. I just renamed it and called it duct hanger state. So in the morning, this is what was given to our guys in the field. In the afternoon, when the guys are done, they give me a file back. And there's going to be a slight difference between the points. Now, I can bring this file in and while we'll when I do that, it's going to show me um, a long list here of all the deltas. But I do want to make sure that I use a specific coordinate system. I set up the coordinate system early on. Now, when I do that, then it's going to show me based on that coordinate system. Now, I'm not going to use this file only because when I did this, I initially uploaded this to BIM 360 Glue. It's going to be the same exact workflow, but I, I'm going to show it to you by accessing the model up in the cloud. So I'm going to go ahead and select my BIM 360 layout file, select my 3D ductwork, and I'm going to do all the points in this example. In this case, I isolated this to four, five, or four points that are off by a specific tolerance. Now, I happen to have four points that are off by, I got a couple points that are off by uh, 0.8 feet, and then some that are off by more than a foot. A nice feature with APL is if I simply touch on a file, I'm going to go ahead and select on, or on, on a point number. When I select this point number, I move this off the screen, it takes me right to that point. If I zoom out, okay, I can see that that, that hanger makes sense. For some reason, when this hanger was put in, maybe I didn't have the structural file with me. And so this hanger was placed in a location where there's steel in the way. Well, when Thad went out to the job site, he discovered the steel was in the way. So he went ahead and decided to relocate that file. Because, I'm sorry, that point. Because he had the background, he had the ductwork, and he actually had the structural steel. Okay, I didn't have the steel initially. Because he had that out in the field, he knew that he could move this particular duct hanger to another location. Well, if I want to just double check another hanger point, I'll click on this one and I'll zoom out. And this one looks like it should have been okay, but for some reason he had to move that one as well. If I look at it, it looks like that point he had to move that one over a foot and a half. Well, if I click on one other point here, we'll just take a look at three. There's actually five. But I'll click on one other point, and it's actually hidden behind that steel. I'm going to rotate my view a little bit so I can see it. But it's this other point right here that was located in a different location. Well, what I could do with APL, oops, sorry, let me bring this up here. What I could do with APL is I could actually 
save this to a report, I could print it, and then I could follow up with my team and say, hey, these five numbers, they're in a different location than what I put in the field. And my field team will come back and say, oh yeah, there was steel in the way, there were other objects in the way, so you need to move those, I had to move those points in the field. Well, this, is, this compare function simply gives me the ability to generate a report, and if necessary, I could also use something by Autodesk called VIN360 field, which allows me to create an issue and post it on, on the internet or uh, up in the cloud, so they, they now have been assigned a task or an issue to resolve those points. If they come back to me and say, hey, I had to move them, those are in the correct location, I can then go through and update my model to match what was done in the field. Now, Thad, do you want me to go ahead and do that, or do you want me to turn that back over to you? Now, go ahead and do it, Mark. Okay. A couple so, more minutes, so. Yep. So I'm going to hit the import function, and now instead of doing a compare, I'm going to import those points. Again, I'm going to pull this from the cloud, and I'm going to select that file, and I'm going to select my points, and I'm only going to bring in. I'm going to just filter this and just do my round duct hangers. And I'm going to make sure I set my coordinate system to what I was using. And I'm going to set that to decimal feet. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to click OK. And it's going to recognize that I have some points in the model that are in a different location than the field. I'm going to select the move option. And I'm going to tell it to go ahead and move my points to the new location. So if I go ahead and zoom, and it looks like I'm going to have to hit undo, guys, because I realized that was probably I selected the wrong location. Real quick here, I'll do that one more time. Import. I'm going to select my file from glue. Then 360 layout, my hangers. And I'm only going to do my round duct hangers. And I'll use my Georgia State Plain Corner system again. So I'll go ahead and click OK now. So now it says my points were moved. And if you take a look, the green circles were the original location of my hangers. Now my Round duct hangers have moved to where they should be to match what was done in the field. So that's that's the workflow. Now my hangers match what was done in the field exactly. And now I have a true as-built model. All right. And that I'll turn this back over to you. I'll make you presenter. Okay. So one of the things that we were just talking about, like Mark said, move, we have two different ways to do that. Um, our solutions are through the TopCon um, software for the field, or we can also use the uh, Autodesk solution, which is the BIM 360 layout. Both of these have basically the same advantages to them. Um, the bigger advantage for the BIM 360 layout is that I'm using an iPad and I have the full model in the field with me. So as I do stuff and as I take these points, it's a very simple drag down of the screen and it updates the um, temporary model up in, the, up, in the, uh, up in glue and Mark can bring that down just like he did and compare those points. Um, APLs, where, where Magnet kind of does more than APL is APL does very good with QA, QC or strict point layout. There's not a lot of engineering or other functions I can do besides point layout and um, uh, some simple offsets and things like that. TopCon software allows you to do a lot more you know, depending on how advanced your guys in the field. You can do simple layout like you do in, in the AutoCAD or in the Autodesk product, the BIM 360. But it also allows me to offset points by distances and angles. It allows me a lot more of what we call COGO or coordinate geometry, grabbing a line off my DWG and pointing it and staking it in case I would need stuff like that. Both have cloud transfers. Um, both have very easy exports. So again, 
we're using this Autodesk workflow, uh, Autodesk product with the APL software, adding ports, importing control, and exporting that to the field, going out and, and not just laying out, but staking out our points in the field, check control, layout points, QA, QC, and get that as built and sending it back to the office. That's our workflow. Now, you don't have to ha necessarily have um, all of this in place. This could be stepped up. You know, you could get APL, get trained, do that, and then buy a robotic total station, the reverse. But these are this is where we want to go as in the coordination between the, the GCs and the subcontractors is to get um, not only the model coordinated, but our field procedures coordinated, i.e. the control, and so that everybody's coming off the same um, positions, and that if I go to check a point and another subcontractor goes to check a point, when we both see that point, we both see the same coordinates on that point. The worst thing that can happen, and when most of our stuff happens, where we start having problems or if I go to a point and somebody else goes to a point with a robotic total station and we're seeing two separate X, Y, and Zs because they're coming off of some other um, a model. So we try to do this as quickly as we could for you. We obviously have um, specific demonstrations if you want to see this personally. Um, we can either come out to you or do it online. But for right now, does anybody have any questions on the webinar? Um, and I don't know if uh, Lisa, if you're if you're back, if you have those questions up, that Mark and I can maybe answer those. Uh, yes, we actually have uh, time for a couple questions. Um, I have: Does the APL does APL run on an iPad? Okay, so APL Autodesk Point Layout runs on the computer, and the product that runs on the iPad is called. BIM 360 layout. So I know that's a little confusing with the terminology by Autodesk, but Autodesk point layout runs on the computer. BIM 360 layout runs on an iPad, and that's what controls the robot. So you can start laying out in the field, staking points, or doing QA, QC, and as built. And that's, that's similar to what Thad was showing you on his end, which is Topcon Magnet. And so BIM 360 layout is similar to Topcon Magnet. They have similar functionality, they just do it a little differently. Okay, and how can you tie this all back into the Faro Point Cloud? Oh, that's a great question. Um, Thad and I do a demo showing uh, GeoShack's scanner. Um, unfortunately, with with the Faro scanner, we don't have a way to tie in control points with the Faro scanner. So we do that visually where we will take the scan and we will move it into position. Um, with the GeoShack scanner, I'm sorry, the Topcon scanner that GeoShack um, typically works with, we actually can tie those control points. So those actual coordinates you saw me place into AutoCAD and Revit, I can actually place those into the Topcon scanner. I can't do that with Ferro. And the Topcon scanner also allows you to, just like a total station, sit on a control point and check into another one to make sure that the distance between those is correct before you scan. And then what that does for us, and, and that's a different, uh, I think a webinar we have coming up in the next month or so, Mark, um, uh, about taking that with the control points and actually it relieves you of all the um, manipulation that Mark was talking about, the rotation and the and the translation that you have to do to try to get the point cloud into the model. Yeah, the, uh, the Topcon scan, when we bring it in, it comes in the first time exactly where it's supposed to. Any more questions? Yes, I have a, one last question. Can you give an example of the total stations to utilize in the field? Sure. Um, total stations that we carry, actually Topcon carries three different robotic total stations. The, the first is the LN100, and uh, let's see if I can uh, find a picture of that real quick. I think we had one earlier. 
There we go. Oh, bring it back up. So there are three different types of total uh, of robotic total stations that Topcon has. The first one is the LN100, which you see in this picture right here. It's really a BIM decking unit. So if you're if you're a general contractor that's providing control to your customers, or if you're a GC that has to bring, or sorry, a subcontractor that has to bring control over long distances, this is really a it's a 350 foot um, range, and it's 15 degrees up and down, but it, it's self leveling, very easy to use. So if you're up on a deck and you've got control points, it works fabulous. If you need something more robust than that, we go over from the BIM decking unit or the or the uh, LN100 as we call it, over to um, Topcon has two models, one called the DS, which stands for direct station, and one for the PS, which stands for power station. Um, these are controlled the same way. Um, we are actually using Bluetooth in all of our all of our um, solutions now, including the ones we use with the Autodesk iPad. We have a Bluetooth bridge so that you're no longer using Wi-Fi in the field. Uh, if you've ever used it in the field, you know how often uh, you have problems with Wi-Fi. So we're all on a complete Bluetooth system now. This is a uh, manually leveling total station. The DS is controlled very much like the LN manually. We can add what we call remote control to that. But typically, when you go to the remote control, you go to one that looks almost identical to the DS. It's called the PS. And that, that one now, you have what we call remote control capabilities of touching one button on your data collector and the instrument automatically turning to you. Um, that's the big differences between, between the mid-end and the, and the higher end. Um, you know, there's, there's ranges and prices. One thing that we, we I, re, I said at the beginning that I will reiterate at the end here is that we don't have a blanket solution for everybody. The reason that uh, Applied Software and GeoShack have worked so well together is we have consultants that come in, see what you're doing, find your solution, find where you want to go, what you want to do, and the order you want to do it with, and provide you a solution that's great for you. So if the LN100 is your solution, we can do that. If one of the other robots is, we can do that. If the APL is in your solution, that is all recommended to you. So it's not a, we don't have a blanket or a, you know, easy fix that says, hey, this will work for everybody. We customize that. Yeah, if I can add to it, as far as the software and the hardware, um, it's easy to use. And normally it's just a couple of days of training for the subs out there and the GCs that are familiar with uh, AutoCAD, Revit, Navisworks. The APL training is half a day of training. Uh, very quick, very easy. If you don't know CAD or Revit um, or Navis, then it's another half a day of training um, to get around the model. Um, as far as the hardware, um, I've trained a number of people on the hardware that obviously has. Um, the hardware is not easy; it's not hard to use. You don't have to be a surveyor. You don't have to be a civil engineer to use this. This was designed for the GCs, for the subs, to be able to use, and it's very easy to use.